Well, hello everybody out there in Facebook world. Um, it's time for our 6.30 Wednesday night live service. So I'm just gonna ramble for a few minutes and wait and let people find the, the room and, and, and get in here. So I am really hoping that, hey Tina Fink, it's so good to see you. And Kelly Hans, yay, Hans family, Eric and Kelly and Ty and Caleb. So good to know you guys are watching. Um, so I am I am just kind of hanging out here for just a minute. There's Angela Ferrar. Hello, Miss Angela. Maybe Miss Hannah is with you. And there's Lori. I have to just say this. Lori and I have been friends for over 25 years. And there's Miss Shannon. It's good to see you, Shannon. So I'm just um I'm gonna wait for just a couple of minutes and let some more people kind of get in here. And by the way, there is this there is this poem about there is no Easter that you guys should read. It kind of reads like Dr. Seuss. And so I just really encourage you guys, if you find that poem on Facebook, I read it and I actually got kind of teared up. And if I had had the time and thought, I would have printed the poem out and read it for you guys. There's Leon and Jeannie. It's good to see you guys. So glad you joined us. And there's Miss Vicki Schottmeyer. Hey, Miss Vicki. Um, so what I'm gonna do, and there's Aaron Williamson, one of my favorite people in the universe. Love me some Aaron Williamson. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna pray and then I'm gonna get started because I wanna talk to you tonight about Passover, the first Passover at Exodus and the Passover on Calvary. So Lord Jesus, we just come before you tonight and Father, we thank you that resurrection's not canceled because of a virus. We thank you that your power and that your victory and that your willingness and ability to save us is not canceled because of a virus. We might not be able to meet as a building or in a building, but we do come together as your church and we are doing that even now. So Father, I ask in the midst of all these things that you put your hand of protection upon each of us and that Father, you cause our hearts to be turned toward you and Father, we, we pray for all those who are suffering right now uh, because of this virus, whether it's physical suffering because they actually had the virus, economic suffering because they've lost their job, um, suffering because someone that they love has contracted this virus. Father, you know, and we are asking you to be strength and light and life. And so, Father, as we open the Bible tonight and talk about you and the great redemptive history that you've given to us in Jesus Christ. I just ask that you, Holy Spirit, would be present and move among us, and that you would ignite our hearts and our imagination with the truth of Passover. For it is in the most excellent and powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So tonight, um, I'm going to start back in the book of um, Exodus, the 12th chapter. And I'm going to read several passages of scripture. And I want to start with three lessons from Passover from a Jewish perspective and, and root this into the 12th chapter of Exodus. And then I want to move us forward to Matthew 27 to the cross. So let's look at this. I'm going to read a selection of passages from Exodus chapter 12, and I'll tell you which passage I'm going to read or which verses I'm going to read before I read them. I'm going to start reading verses 1 through 3. Now, you know the background. The children of God, the children of Abraham, found themselves in Egyptian captivity. Now, I would love to talk and just kind of camp out for a minute and talk about why they were in that place of captivity, but that's not the point tonight. I just... You know, the the point is, when Jesus found us, we were all in captivity. And how we got there was not important. The result and the reality was that Jesus was the one who could get us out of the captivity that we were in. So they're in Egyptian captivity 400 years. And then God raises up a deliverer in Moses to bring the people of God out of Egypt. Now, Egypt is never referred to as Egypt 
by the Jews. Or in the Old Testament, it's never called Egypt. It's translated Egypt. But in Hebrew, the word for Egypt is Mitzram. And Mitzram simply means a narrow, oppressive place. So Egypt was just that, a narrow, oppressive place for Israel. So they're in this captivity. God sends all the plagues. And now there's about to be this 10th plague where all the firstborn are going to die. Chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, in the land of Mitzram, in the land of narrowing, in the land of uh, oppression, this month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month they are each one to take a lamb for themselves according to their father's households, a lamb for each household. Now I'm going to skip down and read verses 7 and 8. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. And they shall eat the flesh that same night roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Now let me just stop here. Unleavened bread is nothing but the wheat or in our context, flour, um, plain flour, no rising element, no soda, no yeast, no rising element in it at all. If you want to make your own unleavened bread, it is it is plain flour with some olive oil and water, and that's it. No salt, no leavening agents at all. So they're to eat the unleavened bread with bitter herbs. The bitter herbs are to remind them of the bitterness of their captivity and their bondage. Sometimes we need to be reminded of just how bad it was when Jesus found us. Because somehow in our humanity, we oftentimes like to romanticize our garbage so that we can go back to it. But it's good for us to remember just how desperate we were when Jesus found us and brought us out of sin. So they're going to eat the flesh that same night, roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. Then I'm going to read verse 11. Now you shall eat it in this manner with your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. They're to eat it in haste because God is about to call them out. And so this is not a long, elaborate meal. This is an, a meal to be eaten quickly because even though they have been in Egypt for 400 years, when God says suddenly, 400 years can just be summed up in a second, and that suddenly comes quickly. So that's verse 11. Now I'm going to read verses 13 and 14. And the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over. Pesach, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Verse 14, now this day will be a memorial to you and you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. Now verse 21, then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, go and take for yourselves lambs according to your families and slay the Passover land. Lamb, verse 22, and you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood which is in the basin and apply some of the blood that is in the basin to the lintel and to the two doorposts and none of you shall go outside the door of his house until morning. I listened to a Jewish rabbi um, this afternoon talk about how in, in history, to his knowledge, this is, this is, this Passover, because for, for the Jewish community, Passover begins at sundown tonight, which is about right now. And so this Passover, because they were told in that first Passover, that first Pesach, that they were to go inside their house and not go outside the door until morning. And that, that all over the world, because of the pandemic, people are being urged and in some, t in some instances um, even mandated to stay inside their houses. So in verse 22, and none of you shall go outside the door of his house until morning. Then verses 24 through 27, and you shall observe this event as an ordinance for you and for your children forever. And it will come about when you enter the land, which the Lord will give you as he has promised that you shall observe this right. 
And it will come about when your children will say to you, what does this rite, what does this ritual mean to you? That you will say, it is a Pesach, a Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians but spared our homes and the people bowed low and worshiped. I want to offer you um, three lessons from Passover. And Stephanie, I see your question. So tonight would have been the night of the Last Supper. There's two different ways of looking at this because of the Jewish calendar and its connection with the Christian calendar. Some Jews observe two Seder meals because it's kind of uncertain as to which one it is. So either tonight or tomorrow night would have been um, the Last Supper. So there's three lessons that we can learn from Passover or Pesach, and Pesach is just the Jewish or Hebrew word for Passover. Exodus 12 tells us about the first Pesach story. Everyone has to put the blood of the lamb on their doorpost and then stay inside their house. They're to eat a meal, and this meal is called a Seder, and Seder actually means order. There's an order to this meal. They're to say certain words, to do certain things, and to eat certain items in a particular sequence. It's the same every year for every observing Jew or observant Jew. The following of the divine order is a bulwark against the chaos of life and this world. The order of Pesach or Passover is following God's divine order and this following of the divine order stabilizes us in chaotic, unstable moments. So the first lesson that we learn about Pesach is that Pesach is about order in the midst of disorder. I think that even though this might mean something a little bit different for the Jewish community than it does for the Christian community, I think we can learn something from this. We live in a world that's full of disorder and chaos. We feel we live a life that is full of unknowns and unpredictable elements. And I meet and talk with so many people who love the Lord with their whole hearts, but they feel unstable inside. Their emotional world is not, it's not sound. It's fluctuating all over the place, and especially now in this chaotic moment with um, the COVID-19 virus. I think that it is good for us to remember that God is a God of order, and He, in the midst of our chaos, provides us with routine and order. And the Passover meal, because certain things have to happen in a certain sequence, and it happens every year for everyone, that it reminds us that in the middle of all of this chaos and instability, God is a God of order. Now, that doesn't mean that we're always going to get up at the same time. It doesn't mean that we're all going to have a set routine for every day. But I think that having order in our lives is a reflection of the divine nature of God because God is a God of order. Pesach, this Passover meal, begins with an affirmation of one's conviction that God is sovereign. And if nothing else, the sovereignty of God should bring a sense of stability to our heart and anchor us to something that looks like order. So the first lesson that we learn about Passover is that God provides order for us in the midst of disorder or chaos. The second lesson that we learn is that Pesach in historical Judaism culminates with the singing of children's songs. The Seder, this, this meal, this Passover meal is designed with children in mind. It's even child-centric, if you, if you want to say that. The children are engaged from as, as soon as they're able to sit up and, and partake at the table with the adults. The children are involved with Pesach or the Seder meal. The Jews believe that if the children are not engaged from an early age, this rooting in tradition and faith will be more difficult for them as they become adults. When one is consistently exposed to the songs of Pesach, Pesach as a child, then as adults, the reality of their childhood will anchor them in their faith and their traditions, and it will in turn anchor them as adults 
in their past and stabilize them in the present. If you've ever been to a Jewish Seder, one of the things that has to catch your attention is the involvement of the children because the children have a very, um, a very integral part in, in this Pesach, in this Passover meal. And, and the night culminates with singing songs that the children are going to be involved in and that they're going to be singing as well. If you want to know just how powerful ritual or routine is, read a child his or her favorite bedtime story and then try to change just one word. They know those stories by heart. They've heard them a hundred times. They want to hear them a hundred more times. And if you change just one word, that little guy, that little gal is going to sit up in bed and say, you did it all wrong. You have to start over again. Ritual is order and it provides consistent realities that allow us to, de to derive a sense of continuity, a sense of purpose and identity. I know that even thinking about this and, and our own personal needs for order and consistency and, and just taking this even back to childhood, I mean, think about it. When I go to church at, at Bethesda, that's my home church, I know that there are certain things that I can expect. I know that that the service is going to start with 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 certain types of songs. I know that at some point we are going to pray for people. I know that at some point there's going to be an opportunity for us to participate with with giving. I know that there's going to be an opportunity for us to hear and to respond to the word of God. And and all of those things it might vary a little bit from time to time, but all of those things create a routine for us. And routine really is important and impactful, not only for our adult hearts and minds, but it's also important for children. I, I am a lover of contemporary Christian music, and I listen to a lot of it. But I am also a believer in traditional hymns. When my mom was in an Alzheimer's unit, and she and her companions in that unit they didn't remember what they had for breakfast, but someone could start a chorus of amazing grace and every resident within that Alzheimer's unit could all join in and sing every single verse of amazing grace because there's something about the songs that rooted them and anchored them. And they, they might not remember their name. They might not remember what they had for breakfast. They might not even remember the faces and names of their own children, but they remember those hymns. I, I just have to say this for all of you, for those of you who have children, who have grandchildren, who have children in your life, do not underestimate the power of music and routine in your children's lives and in rooting them in that. So Pesach or Passover reminds us, number one, about order in the midst of chaos. It reminds us, number two, about the importance of routine with children and of keeping all of our traditions, the things that, 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 that we call our Christian traditions. And I'm not talking about legalism or anything like that. I'm talking about the traditions of the church. Resurrection Sunday would be just such a tradition. Um, we have a tradition at Bethesda. We have our Christmas Eve service and communion. These traditions, these routines, they build something much deeper in our heart than just rote memory. It becomes the, the basis or foundation upon which we can build and grow in our faith. So it, re it reminds us that there's order in the midst of chaos. It reminds us of the importance of ritual and routine with regard to our children and keeping our children, whether it's our grandchildren or our biological children or someone else's children that are just important in our life, of keeping them central to everything that we do and everything that we're building in our faith. The third, and perhaps for me, the most important and the most connecting uh, lesson from Passover is that of redemption. Because you see, when God brings Israel out of Egypt, there is a redemptive tone to everything that takes place. The redemption of the people of God, 
the children of Abraham are brought out of Egypt. And remember, Egypt means Mitzram, or, or Egypt is Mitzram all throughout the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament. And Mitzram means a narrow, a tight, an oppressive place. God redeems us. He pulls us out. He takes us out. He delivers us from this narrow place. He delivers us from a place that, that pushes us down with oppression and keeps us from being everything that we're destined to be. Now, I would like to say that that oppression is completely cured the minute that we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But I think that this Passover, this Pesach, this Easter, this resurrection, whatever title you want to put on this season or this holiday, holy day that we're celebrating this week and culminating with Sunday morning, I think that there are some squeezed, oppressive places that we are all in that God might want to deliver us from. I think that if you're struggling with prejudice, um, with judgmentalism, that is a narrow place and God wants to deliver you from that. If you are a person who just finds yourself constantly in the negative, I think God wants to bring you out of that narrow place and bring you into a place where you can perhaps see the more beautiful side of life and the more positive elements of life. But you guys get the way that or the direction that I'm going. Now, what I want you to do, I'm going to, it's going to feel like I'm shifting gears, but really I'm not. I want you to fast forward with from Exodus chapter 12, almost to fast forward 2000 years. Now the world is in an oppressive place. Rome has basically put its thumb on, on every nation, and one of the nations that's experiencing this Roman oppression is Israel, the Jews, the people of Judah. And not only are they experiencing Roman oppression, from, with, from within their own religious ranks, they're experiencing the legalistic oppression of laws and rituals that cannot help them. Um, they're experiencing um, basically a narrow place from people that should want to teach them the law and teach them the truth, but instead they're putting even more yokes and more oppression onto the people and they're using the people for their own means instead of being there to serve the people. So in Matthew 27, we find Jesus on the cross. He is the Pesach lamb. He is the Passover lamb. He is, he is the one that is slain for the sins of all humanity, not just all those who were 2,000 years ago, not all those who were way back then, all the way through history to 2020. So we are looking at the Passover lamb on the cross dying for the sins of of the world because that's what's happening in Matthew chapter 27. I'm going to read verses 33 through 56, but let me tell you what I'm going to emphasize. I know that on Friday night, we're doing um, a Good Friday service, and it's going to start at 7 o'clock. It's going to be available on the Bethesda page at BethesdaCommunityChurch.com, um, on the Bethesda YouTube channel, as well as on Facebook. Um, as on Facebook. So however you want to tap into that. And we're going to be taking um, the seven last words of Jesus from the cross. And each member of the pastoral team is going to do a, a couple of minutes of a devotional thought on those last words of Jesus. You are going to want to be a part of that. And then we're going to have communion. And, um, and so that's going to be our way of, of coming together for Pesach or Passover. So Instead of looking at like the seven last words of Christ from the cross, I want to look at the people that had gathered around the cross and look at their attitudes and look at the words that they spoke. So I'm going to read Matthew 27 verses 33 through 56. Now it sounds like a lot and I'm sorry you have to listen to my voice that much. Um, and when they had come to a place called Gal Galgotha, which means place of a skull, they gave him wine to drink mingled with gall, and after tasting it, he was unwilling to drink. And when they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves, casting lots. And sitting down, they began to keep watch over him there. I want to really emphasize verse 36. And sitting down, they began to keep watch over him there. 
I guess if I were going to give this, this portion of the sermon a title, it would be the ones who were watching Jesus. In verse 7, 37, and they put up over his head the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. At that time, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days yourself, if you are the son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priest also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him and saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross and we shall believe him. He trusts in God. Let him deliver him now if he takes pleasure in him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers also who had been crucified with him were casting the same insult at him. Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of those who were standing there, when they heard it, began saying, This man is calling for Elijah. And immediately one of them ran, and taking a sponge, he filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave him a drink. But the rest of them said, Let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split, and the tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now the centurion and those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and things that were happening, they became very frightened, and they said, Truly this was the Son of God. And many women were there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to them, among whom was Mary Magdalene, along with Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Now, these people sat down and they watched him on the cross. You know, when we look at something, what we see depends on more than just what we're looking at. When we look at something, we bring a lot more to that visual image than just the actual thing that we're seeing. We bring our past experiences. We bring our education and training. I know that when I see someone sneeze and cough, I see someone sneeze and cough. My husband, who is trained as a doctor, as a medical doctor, when someone sneezes and coughs, he says, oh, their face is swollen and their cheeks are red and their eyes are puffy and they've got bags under their eyes. They are having an allergy attack. My husband's going to see something very different because he's going to bring his education and his training and his experience. So we bring our past experiences, our education and our training. We bring our belief system. We bring a mindset. What we what what we have other what we or others say about a thing or situation for instance if i have never met someone we'll just say someone named brianna if i've never met brianna and someone tells me well i know brianna and brianna is one two three when i meet brianna i already have a preconceived idea about her because of what someone else has already told me so when we look at a situation we also bring into that situation what other people have told us about it we also bring our talents and our personality our spiritual gifting to the table we bring our gender as a woman, I see things from a very different perspective at times than, than my male counterparts do. And that's not bad. That is very good. And we need both of us working together. Also, I bring my age. I am no longer in my 20s or my 30s. I bring a certain, I have lived through the 70s. Yes, I have. And so I bring a certain when I see somebody walk around in a pair of bell bottoms, I am thinking, I have seen this before. I've seen this trend before. But we bring all kinds of things to a situation. So when we see something, we don't just see it for what it is. We bring all of these other things into it as well. So every person at the cross, looking on at the cross, they all brought a perspective to the cross. Some of their perspectives were just wrong and evil. Some of their perspectives were just slightly 
out of sequence or, or out of perspective. So the first group that we see watching Jesus or sitting there and watching him were the soldiers who basically shot craps for his, uh, his garments. They were gambling for his garments. These men were at the cross for personal gain. The only reason that they were there, they did not care about who was on the cross. They didn't even care about why they were on the cross. They were there for their own personal gain. They saw the cross as a way to make money and to have some fun and entertainment in the process. They were at, their, at the cross for their personal and temporal profit. They wanted to see what they could get out of Jesus. These men saw an opportunity to make a profit and Jesus was nothing to them. I don't want to speak ill or unkindly of anyone or anything, but I will tell you, beware of people who try to sell you Jesus. People who tell you that if you give something to them, then Jesus will do something for you. Because I'm afraid that they might not be any better than these men gambling for the garments of Jesus. So I just want to make you aware that just because someone talks like a Christian, looks like a Christian, and maybe has a large following, doesn't mean that they are really representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ and of his church. These men wanted to see what they could get out of Jesus. And I'm afraid that our human nature hasn't changed a great deal in 2,000, 3,000 years. That there are still those among us who want to see what they can get out of Jesus and they try to turn a prophet on the Son of God. Those were people who were sitting at the cross and watching at the cross. The second group of people that are sitting at the cross, they're the ones who publicly displayed the charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. These are the ones who wanted to sit there and pass judgment on Jesus. These are the ones who wanted to sit there and they were going to say either he is this or he is that. They're the ones who want to say if he were the son of God, then he would do this, this, and this, and this. They're the ones who want to sit and pass judgment on him. These are the people who saw an opportunity to boost their ego at the expense of Jesus. You know, we might not be too guilty of trying to boost our ego at the expense of Jesus, but how many times do we try to boost our ego at the expense of someone else? How many times do we try to say, oh, that person is this, this, and this based on this, this, and this, and we pass judgment on people when all we're trying to do is set ourselves up as judge and jury and executioner? I think that we need to take a lesson from these people at the cross on what not to do. We are not in Christianity for what Christianity can do for us. We are not using Jesus to turn a prophet. We are not trying to boost our egos at the expense of Jesus or someone who follows Jesus. Then the third, these two guys were the thieves that were on the cross. There were three men on a cross. Jesus was in the middle. One thief, actually both thieves, started out hurling insults at Jesus. One mocked him and joined in hurling insults at him. This is the man who knows what he has done, and yet he takes no responsibility for his actions and no real concern for his eternal destiny, and he mocks anyone that does. This thief saw only himself. Now, I, you know... I've been a follower, of a committed, as, as much as I possibly can been. God, i got my words all mixed up. I have been a follower of Jesus to the best of my ability for 40 years. Since I was 19 years old, I've, I've followed and loved the Lord to the best of my ability and the grace that he, that he puts and allows upon my life. And I have heard all kinds of crazy things from a lot of different people in those 40 years. There are people who know what they've done. They know that they are that they are not right with God. They know that they are not morally right. They know that there is sin in their life, and yet they want to take no responsibility for their actions. 
There's no real concern for their eternal destiny. And anyone who comes to faith in Christ, anyone who surrenders their life to Christ, taking responsibility. I am a sinner, God, and I need for you to save me. I'm a sinner in need of salvation. They will mock that person and put them down and belittle them for their faith in Christ. This thief saw only himself. And I am so concerned that there are still people who hang out around the cross. They know the gospel. They know scripture. They know who Jesus is. They'll even say that they believe that Jesus is the Son of God, but they have never surrendered their lives to the Lord. That person sees only themselves and thinks only of themselves. Then there's the other thief. This thief also mocked Jesus and hurled insult, insults at Jesus, but then he asked for mercy. He knows that he's a sinner, and he's taking ownership of his condition, and he's asking in faith for mercy. This man saw himself, but he saw himself in the presence of love and mercy, and it changed him in an instant, just like that. So... You have three men on the cross. One died in his sin, never having repented, never having surrendered his life to Christ. He died in his sin. The other man, thief on the cross, died for his sin. He knew that he was a thief. He was on the cross. He was going to die. And yet he cried out in faith for Christ to save him, and even though he still had to die for his sin because he cried out in faith, he went to be with Jesus in paradise. One died in his sin, one died for his sin, but the man in the middle, Jesus, died because of sin, not because of his own sin. Jesus died because of the sin of humanity and because he was the Pesach, the Passover lamb of God. So one died for his sin, one died in his sin, but Jesus died because of sin so that you and I might go free and have a relationship with the Heavenly Father. So three groups down, several more to go. There were the soldiers who gambled for his garment. These men saw Jesus as an opportunity to make profit. The second group, they saw an opportunity to boost their ego at the expense of Jesus and then the two robbers on either side of him. The fourth group of people, these are the ones who mocked and shook their heads. You know, there are people who do just that. They look at Christianity and they go, there's no proof. I, how can you believe that? There's no tangible empirical evidence for any of this. And why is Christianity more important than any other faith? And why is Christianity, you know, the only way to have a relationship with the Heavenly Father? They mocked and shook their heads and they said, if you are the son of God, then come down from the cross. You know, there's never enough proof to convince these people because they always want just one more miracle. These men or these people saw an opportunity to bully a man that could not defend himself, to take the spotlight off of their own miserable lives and put it on someone else while they could sit in the shadows. Um... I know I have heard this so many times. I hear Christians say, if I could just see a miracle, then I would never doubt God again. And then I hear people who don't know Jesus say, if God would just show me a miracle, then I would believe that he is who he says he is. Let me give you some historical evidence to counter that thought. The children of Israel in Exodus chapter 19, they are camped out around the mountain of God. They have seen the sea part. They've walked across on dry ground. They saw Pharaoh's army chase them and the sea cover up on Pharaoh's army and kill Pharaoh's army. And now they're camped out around the mountain of God. They see fire. They see lightning. They hear thunder. The earthquakes beneath their feet because God has has released his presence on the mountain of God to give the law of God, which we call the Ten Commandments. They're seeing all of that. They're right there. They're hearing it. They're seeing it. They're feeling it. All of their empirical senses are involved in this moment. 
And yet these very people who could see and hear and feel the presence of God on the mountain of God, they build a golden calf and worship a golden calf at the base of the mountain of God. Check it out. If miracles were all that it took for us to believe in God, then we would all be believers because no one can see a baby be born without losing your breath and going, surely there is a God. And I know that for every one of us, God has done something, whether it's a sunset or a sunrise, or whether it's just a sense of calm in the midst of some emotional storm, God has shown himself Psalm 19 says that the heavens declare the glory of God. And so I know that God has shown himself to us in so many different ways. And we are so much like those people that shook their head and just say, if you come down from the cross, then we'll believe. But there's never enough proof. There always is the need for one more miracle to prove it. The fifth group. These are the religious leaders. I think these might be the most I, is scuzzy a word. These might be the scuzziest people in the entire group because these are the people who said they knew the truth. These are the people who said that they knew and followed the ways of God, that knew the word of God. The religious leader said to Jesus, save yourself. They didn't want to believe Jesus and they didn't want anyone else to believe him either. Jesus had disturbed their fence laws and now he's going to die for it. The fence laws were not the laws of God. The fence laws were the laws of men, the laws of religious leaders that were put up around the actual law to try to keep you from breaking the law. And so they believed that their fence laws were as powerful and as important as the law. And Jesus broke their fence laws. For instance, he ate with publicans and sinners. And for instance, on the Sabbath, he had bread with his, with his disciples. So there were all these little fence laws. He healed on the Sabbath. There were all these little fence laws that Jesus broke, but he never broke the law of God. See, when they saw Jesus on the cross, what they saw was the defeat of a phony and their own personal victory. They believed that his voice was going to be silenced and they could once again have power over the people. That's what they saw because that's what they were in this for. They wanted power over the people. So whether it was the power of saying, you don't get salvation unless I say you get salvation. And these are the laws that you have to keep. And my fence laws are every bit as important as these other laws. So these religious leaders are thinking that they have the power and that Jesus was trying to take that power away from them. And so they saw him on the cross as his defeat and their victory. Then there's the centurion. This is the sixth person that was around the cross. The centurion, he said, surely this is God's son. Literally, it reads, surely this is a son of the gods. He gives no indication that he's placing faith in Jesus as the only begotten of God. He's just seeing Jesus as another God in a pantheon of gods. When he saw Jesus, he did not see and understand that Jesus was, new, was unique. He just saw Jesus as the embodiment of one of the Roman gods, and he was one of many gods. You know, there are people in our culture today that they're, they're fine. Jesus is a prophet. Jesus is a teacher. Jesus is a God. You know, Christianity could become wholesale for every people group in the world, just about, if we would just change one word. Instead of saying that Jesus is the Son of God, if we would say Jesus is a son of God, it would change everything. But you know, it would also change our salvation because our salvation depends on us believing that Jesus Christ is the only begotten son of the Father and that there is no other way to the Father but through Jesus Christ. Our Christianity is built on that foundation. When he sees Jesus, he doesn't see and understand the uniqueness of the Son of God. 
He just thinks that he's another god in a collection of gods. The seventh and final group of people, the women and a few of the disciples, are at the cross. The only thing that motivated them to be at the cross was the fact that they loved him. They didn't understand what was happening. They didn't understand that he was dying for the sins of humanity. They didn't understand that he was the Pesach lamb, the Passover lamb. They didn't understand this, but they loved him. Not because of what they thought he might do for them, another miracle or healing. They loved him for who he was. He was their friend. In the case of Mary, he was her son. He was their teacher. He was their rabbi. When they saw Jesus on the cross, they saw the end of their hopes. They saw crushed dreams. They saw crumpled beliefs. They had wanted a Messiah that would crush the Roman Empire, that would free them from the Roman Mitzram, the Roman oppression and narrowing, and rule with righteousness and bring truth and justice back to the religious leadership. They couldn't understand him as the Messiah that would save him from their sins. When we stand around the cross, we fall into one of those seven categories at some point in time in our lives. But it's not enough to just stand around the cross. The cross calls you to make a decision. You see, the Passover lamb was not effective if you didn't take the blood of the lamb and put it on the doorpost of your home. Going back to the passages that I read to you in Exodus chapter 12, the redemption is only good for those that apply the blood to their lives. And so whoever is watching this with me tonight, whoever might watch this in the days ahead, you're in one of those seven categories of people if you haven't applied the blood to your life. And that's metaphorical language, simply saying, if you haven't received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then you fall in to one of those seven groups of people. All you have to do to put the blood on your doorpost and to enter into your home, to enter into, metaphorically speaking, to enter into the kingdom of God, it's not rocket science. Even a child can do it. It's as simple as this. Call upon the name of the Lord. Call upon the name of Jesus and ask him to forgive you of your sin and confess your faith that he is the son of God and he'll save you. Maybe you can just pray that prayer with me right now tonight. In the name of Jesus, we come to you and we confess, Jesus, that you are the son of God. And we ask you to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We believe that you were the ultimate final Passover lamb. And we ask that your blood be applied to our lives so that you can say to us, like you did to that thief, that we will be with you when we step out of time and into eternity. Father, going back to the lessons of Pesach, or Passover. Father, in the midst of chaos, I ask that you remind us that you are a God of order and that you are sovereign. I ask you, my Father, to keep us thoughtful and mindful of the importance of teaching these truths to our children and to our children's children. And I ask you, my Father, that you would remind us that our redemption comes from you and nowhere else through your Son, Jesus Christ. So, Father, it is in his great name that we pray. Amen. Thank you guys so much for joining me tonight and just bless you. And um, I'll see you guys on Tuesday for Bible study. But you better be there for the Good Friday service, Friday at 7. And then we are having a full out Easter service online Sunday morning. So I'll see you guys there. Bless you.